So as you can see, uh, this is about inclusive design and the next billion. Now, you know, whenever we talk about digital futures now, it's intrinsically, uh, you know, about inclusivity. It's about equity. And everybody, I would say, theoretically or on paper have gotten on board, whether it's government agencies, NGOs, to academics, to activists, I mean, across board, including all the tech companies. I mean, so there is that momentum because there's rising pressure that you need to think inclusively by design, right? And, you know, there's this field has a legacy, right, of values and design for decades about what kind of values go into the design of systems, because how do you build assessment rubrics to assess that which is of value to us? So we had to make transparent what are those values in the first place. But the way in which values have been shaped over decades has been very much top down, right? This idea of what is a good society, what is a good system. And in, you know, recent years, there's been a tremendous pushback, particularly because there's much of a difference and disconnect between who it's being built for and who is building these systems, right? So today I'm going to talk about a population, what I call the next billion users, who have been for the longest time neglected, but have become fundamentally important. And if, if anything, let me even make a harder case, are going to be the ones who are paving the future for the way in which we can reimagine, uh, reimagine systems, the way in which we love, the way in which we connect with each other, romance, uh, you know, fintech, and even the fate of our planet. So I kind of said, yes, I'm a digital anthropologist, but I sort of put multiple hats on. So I'm actually at the Erasmus Center for Data Analytics as an academic director. So very much involved in tech and business folk uh, groups, as well as in the media studies and philosophy. So I navigate very different disciplines. And I've been working for more than a couple of decades with a number of public and private sector actors. So much of my talk is drawn from that, right? I mean, in fact, it even culminated in a book called The Next Billion Users, which came out a few years ago. And this basically was based on my digital anthropological uh, work. Now, that's just a fancy way of saying that I basically study how people use digital media and make sense of it in their everyday lives. And for the last two decades, I've spent uh, much time, particularly in low-income countries, in India, Brazil, uh, South Africa, Namibia, and Nigeria, looking particularly at how young people are using these digital media technologies. So this pretty much came together, you know, in this book. And what was really particularly interesting in the book's release in, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning of 2020, is that it became particularly of interest amongst all the tech company uh, suspects, as well as a lot of the aid agencies. Because, well, what was actually comforting is I criticized aid agencies tremendously, and I will get to that. And they took it to heart, and they even invited me to um, you know, uh, reform, they got me on the board. So now I sit on a number of boards from UNESCO, UN, UNHCR, I'm engaged with for their work plan to, you know, UNDP. Anyway, so basically the UN suspects, but, you know, the tech companies too, almost every big tech company has approached me. And it's not a coincidence because what's happening is in the last two to three years, every single tech company has set up their next bill news lab whether it's Google, Intel, Spotify. In fact, I was there at the inauguration of Spotify. Uh, Google, uh, you know, started out with about 20 people and now it's become quite a number, hundreds of people. So why is that the case? It's not because it's altruistic, right? It is because, well, you know, the old adage, actually oldish adage, because uh, in academia, we kind of dis dismiss now data as a new oil as a very extractive metaphor and actually is very much the problem, right? Because data is a new oil basically commodifies something which is intrinsically about our everyday social life. Data is actually everyday communicative practice, which gives meaning to our relationships. 
So there's a huge pushback with this term, at least amongst academics, right? But when it comes to practitioners, especially business folk and tech companies, they see it in a literal sense, in a sense that this is scarce resource that needs to be mined, needs to be gathered, and there is a massive race, the AI arms race, and whoever gets the most amount of data wins the future of the digital, uh, you know, uh, fate, right? So... Um, now, what basically, so it's not a coincidence that these labs from the next billion years, the labs have set up across the world because there's a lot invested in understanding how these users are basically using technologies. So firstly, what are, you know, let's take a step back and who are these next billion users, right? Well, they're dominantly young people who are outside the West. So we're talking about 75 to 80% of the world's population who are young, who live in, you know, uh, countries like Sub-Saharan, uh, I mean, areas like Sub-Saharan Africa to South Asia, the fastest growing youth populations in the world. And basically, they're going to define the future of our demographics, the, you know, and the future of digital, basically, right? Because these are where the sheer number of users lie. So, um, they're also dominantly, you know, low income populations who are living in these countries of and what you call as aspirational demographics. They are very keen to embrace the digital. And this is compounded by the fact that in the last decade, there's been radical changes in the digital and the data economy because initiatives like GEO, which is basically uh, uh, you know, from a billionaire, uh, Mukesh Ambani in India and the company, a legacy company called Reliance set up to basically defy and even disrupt the data economy and making data from some of the most expensive, which was in India about a decade ago to the cheapest in the world, right? So you have the data economy transformed completely and India is exporting that model to many countries in the global south. So, in fact, you get a better deal on the data economy than somewhere in Germany or the Netherlands or elsewhere, right? And then you combine that with the spectrum of choices you have from Chinese smartphones to a variety for just like $50 to $100 right now, right? So this is a potent mix that makes people very, very eager to capture the next billion user market. So... I'd like to now make the case, I hope to consolidate the case, uh, that the global south is the radical normative because, you know, we often talk about the margins of uh, populations, like the marginalized, right, uh, the ones at the fringe, but the fringe is the majority, right? They are the marginalized majority. And they are the radical normative in a sense that if you look at the stats, right, U.S. accounts for fewer than one in 15 of the world's internet users. So that's just six 0.4%. Internet users across the world's highly developed economies account for less than one third of the world's total connected population. And then if you look at what is called the next web, just India and China alone constitutes a majority of users today. They've already overtaken, right? And they have not even reached market saturation. Um, we're talking about 40%, right? So there's a lot of room for growth just between India and China, let alone the rest of the countries in the global south. And if you look at it, so that's the scale aspect. If you look at the intensity, the now average young person, say, in uh, China is using it, the Internet actively for twice the amount of time than, say, the average user in Boston or in Germany or, you know, or anywhere else in the West. Because oftentimes, this is one of the few little recourses to experience and self-actualize and connect with people. And there's a whole variety of reasons that I'm going to go into. But the intensity is tremendous. And then you put on top of it that they are preferring audiovisual content above all other content. In fact, text is very minimal, right? And it shouldn't be a surprise. In fact, I was working... Um, in 2020 with KPMG on a what they call the Tech Trends India report. And what was interesting is he revealed that the highest audio-visual consumption took place amongst the lowest socioeconomic group. 
Now, of course, it's about the sheer scale of it, but also it's an extraordinary uh, preference for audiovisual content because of high level of illiteracy, the fact that India has 22 regional languages and, you know, we're talking about thousands of dialects. So the internet is not built for them. So if you have a huge, tremendous social linguistic barrier, you do default into audiovisual, right? So with this data rich sort of consumption at a very intense level, at this extraordinary scale, this has become and is the future of the digital, right? And moreover, what's very interesting is so in the last about two years in particular, I've been hired by a number of uh, tech companies because they, under the name of equity product design, uh, you know, under um, the notion of uh, how do we create inclusive design, right? So we, and usually um, one after the other, they all are asking for India being the test bed of innovation because of the social linguistic diversity, its democratic potentials and its youth dividend that it's looked upon as a live laboratory for the rest of the global South, right? So this is basically what is happening and I'm mapping it out for you. And in fact, if anything, one of the more conservative tech reports, which is called the, you know, from VR Social Hootsuite, which gives you the Silicon Valley tech trends every year, um, reported the next big trend in digital won't emerge from a Western market. So we even have that conservative say all doubling down on the fact that we need to look at the global south if we are talking about the future of digital, right? So... All right, so let's step up, take a step back and see how is the Global South, you know, being approached. And what's interesting well, is that in many ways, there is a very traditional mindset, even though they are convinced of the case and they're investing tremendous amounts of resources and manpower into, or rather human power into, uh, you know, into this area, there is, you know, you have issues like this from the economist, the new scramble for Africa, right? And oh, maybe Africa can also win it this time. I mean, completely tone deaf to the sort of, you know, colonial indications and legacy of, you know, Western powers going and carving out Africa for, and, you know, in extremely extractive ways. So in no wonder we have a metaphor of data colonialism come up in this time and age because of these kinds of media coverage. Um, the fact remains is the industry still behaves extremely traditionally with a very conservative mindsets, right? So again, I'm not going to mention specific tech actors because, well, I have signed an NDA with all of them, but you can guess these typical massive, you know, tech oligarch, uh, tech oligarchs and the way in which they organize. So I can confidently say that it continues to remain as a prototype user is typically white, male, middle class, Anglo-Saxon, right? So, and this is not unusual. We have a number of works out there, which has actually proven my case anyway, that majority of the way in which products and services are being designed is with that kind of user in mind, even though they are barely representative of the diversity of the world's population. In fact, if you look at the medical industry, you know, if you look at um, you know, in the auto industry and seat belts. So there's so many cases, right? Like why are seat belts designed mainly for a man's body versus a woman's body, which causes more accidents or like the temperatures in offices, right? And why is it set to metabolic rates of men versus, so there's already a whole di gender dimension. And then you put the sort of intersectionality of say race and, you know, uh, the global angle and well, you're pretty much excluding by design, by default, uh, majority of the world. So, right, you know, the fact is that we need to rethink prototypes, right, of the prototypical user. Also, what's fascinating is the organizational structure. I have been pretty surprised as I navigate the bureaucracies of tech companies while working with them is that there is a hierarchy internally of how they operate. So, 
international teams. Uh, there's a, a, often an inclusive design or equity team, and they don't talk to each other because equity and uh, equity and diversity, may, say especially in Silicon Valley, means about race. So it's about you know dealing with the racial issues in the U.S. and that doesn't permeate to the rest of the world. Um, they literally refer to countries outside the United States as rest of world, right? So, um, so that is a sort of language also in which, you know, uh, dialogue takes place in these tech companies. Um, there's also a very siloed approach. So oftentimes when I'm working, I have to have separate presentations with the marketing team, with the cloud computing team, and they don't talk to each other. So if you're trying to assess the, you know, resilience of a product, the sustainability or its inclusiveness, um, you pretty much have a very divided, you know, stratosphere internally and employees are not really actually engaging with each other, including we're talking about from at any point in time, right? It usually tends to be a sort of, okay, here's a, here's a product that you, you know, just a sort of a PR like internally that you can be aware of. So obviously that's itself an issue. And then there's a sort of a legacy of, you know, where does the next billion users terminology and concept and ideation come from? And it's not new. There is, you know, if you, you, you kind of wind back in 1990s, the one of the best selling New York Times business books was called The Bottom of the Pyramid. And this was by a business guru, Prahalad, and it kept staying on top, right? Because why? He said to all these industries and companies saying, hey, guys, we don't need to make a choice between inclusivity and profit. It can be a win-win solution because of the economy of scale. You just need to think differently, right? So a case in point was when he was, you know, um, mentoring Unilever in India. And he said, look, just think about the typical user who doesn't have a monthly salary and look at the fact that majority of the people have a daily da daily wage so they can't make future plans so what if you were to design products on a day-to-day -day level of consumption so thereby the invention of this uh, shampoo sachet packets where you can rip off and it's just a daily usage right never mind the fact that today if we were to design that we would start to panic about the you know uh, the environmental degradation because of all the tremendous plastic waste right so that was the bottom of the pyramid. And then you, you know, move even before that was the term emerging markets, which, by the way, is still prevalent in many of the tech companies because it's linked to Wall Street. Wall Street needed to make, you know, um, Global South attractive because they were called developing countries and underdeveloped countries. And, you know, typical of the, again, the colonial legacy of there's a prototype, which is a Western market and the Western economy, which is the ideal state, and then the developed state, and then the rest of the countries would catch up, you know, never mind the fact of the, you know, centuries of extractive, uh, you know, colonial legacies and policies, right? So that was basically emerging markets was rebranding of developing countries so people can feel a little more comforted in terms of investing in the global south and then they had to be more selective so they came up with a BRICS model brazil russia india china and south africa reassuring people that we've got the tigers you know and you can like feel more reassured yeah now in terms of the aid agencies now i've been working with a number of them and i sit on a number of the boards and it's such a challenge. I mean, it's such a tremendous challenge to change my mindset because it's extraordinarily top down and it's very paternalistic, right? So it's all about what sh what is good for them. And they're barely often consulted. They, I mean, the people who are the beneficiaries is what they call them, right? So there's a deeply instrumental and utility driven approach to them. In fact, there's a popular sort of joke in the field that we are suffering from pilotitis, which is basically that there's hundreds of thousands of pilot uh, test cases for innovation and assessment, but they're not designed to scale. And there's a reason for this, right? There's a graveyard. If you, you take it on the digital level, you, there's a graveyard of apps. 
In fact, I was commissioned to do a report on very much this um, aspect on the prize-based innovation scheme at UNESCO. And it was shocking because of the landscape right now on, you know, a number of these aid agencies where many of the board members are now tech philanthropists. So the, the game has changed, basically, because now it's all about how do you make connectivity a sustainable business model? I mean, so this comes even from internally, from within uh, UN agencies, where connectivity is not a right for, say, the millions of refugees because it's not sustainable. So rights are applied to those who are citizens, but not those who are in between. And we know because of the climate crisis, the in-betweenness is just going to exp expand exponentially. So, and then there's, of course, a sort of savior complex, right? So, I mean, I've argued in my book that what if this is the way innovation is construed, which is basically a construction of using the global south as live laboratories to test your products and services and extract data to create AI-based tools for the Western market, then we'd need less innovation, right? And I've been making that case again and again because that's exactly how innovation is being sold. It's not a coincidence that like majority of AI for good initiatives are stemming and being pushed by Silicon Valley in the name of altruism because it allows for an opportunity to data extract in the name of doing good and thereby circumventing a lot of the regulations uh, at place, right? So that's the climate for aid agencies. And then you have governments, right? And you have governments where, you know, there's, especially with the pandemic, the rising inequality, like, uh, uh, you know, mocked by what Thomas Piketty says, is like akin to the 19th century ridiculous inequality that we face. And of course, this, you know, with the, the threat to the, uh, you know, uh, world peace with what's happening between Ukraine and Russia, there is, you know, legitimately, I understand this inward lookingness. How do you, you know, resilience has become, let's go local, right? Let's not do global because global is not to be trusted. In fact, the articles upon articles are even questioning the fate of globalization. But that would be sort of misleading in many ways because globalization is intrinsically very much part of our everyday fabric because the massive and the most formidable problems we face today are intrinsically global in nature, whether it's a climate crisis, you know, global inequality, you know, financial inequality, uh, you know, to uh, uh, peace and war, it is affecting everybody, whether we like it or not. So you don't have a choice to go local versus global. This is a sort of a false dichotomy, right? And moreover, if we don't watch out, right, we will actually have the most splintered and most undemocratic space at a very time where we really need to come together. And we've seen how we can make a difference when we come together with the vaccinations uh, and the actual miraculous coordination and cooperation and innovation to come out with the vaccinations for the pandemic, right? So we see the proof in concept when we cooperate, right? When we get over these political hurdles, when we decide that this is to everybody's interest, Right. So um, but yet when you see something like the Green Deal, which is, you know, the GDPR plus plus, which is also talking about the triple bottom line, including the fact that it had inclusivity also means that we have to include the planet in our imaginary. Right. Is that you see about multiple times there it talks about European values and European context. It's all about the fortress Europe. So the vision of global is actually really European by nature. It's as if the global supply chain begins and ends in Europe. And these sort of fictions that we're creating are going to make it even worse in terms of not being honest about the global supply chains, whether it's a mining in Congo uh, and the sort of like the content moderation in the Philippines and Vietnam, or it is like the manufacturing of smartphones in India and China and the data plants. And not to forget the data localization policies taking place across the global south, which is really a pushback against any kind of sort of 
what they call the tech oligarchs way and, you know, uh, and tech colonialism taking place in the global south. So all this is to say that there's much room to rethink our inward lookingness very much at this point in time, right? So I'm actually, it's interesting because even when we are doing this, so I'm actually currently uh, just signed up to be on the board of the Indian government partnering with Process. And for those who don't know Process, it is the biggest tech venture capital company in the world that has actually, uh, that puts money into uh, tech innovations outside the West. And they happen to be based in Amsterdam. So Process is funding the Indian government so it's very explicit now that whether it's tech philanthropy in aid agencies to clearly tech companies in the industry level to even governments where policies are being shaped by, you know, by tech investor firms. I, you know, I'm very much involved in seeing this is about the future of the digital for the next decade of the digital economy, where India again is a prototype for the rest of the global south. And I believe my duty is to engage regardless of my reservations, because if it's not us, then who else, right? We as academics have to step up and try to see if we can make a difference in these contentious times. So again, us versus them, the standard sort of, you know, divide between the two is well worth sort of disrupting. And how we plan to do it is by first starting by, you know, breaking the three myths, which are barriers to inclusive design. Number one being the pyramid of needs. I mean, you know, I wish I didn't have to contest this, but this is still very much uh, a sort of a go-to thinking that this is intrinsically how majority of the global poor, the next billion users function, which is that they somehow need to satisfy their physiological needs, safety, social esteem, and then go to self-actualization. And this is a you know, decades old sort of theory by Maslow, which got academically completely debunked, right? And yet today it is still a default thinking. And if anything, it is the very opposite. We need to put the pyramid on its head because what is driving the next billion user is very much the need to self-actualize. And you know, it shouldn't be surprising because if you think about who these next billion users are, they're basically, majority of them are teenagers with teen aspirations of self-actualization. I mean, you've got to picture this, right? These, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in, you know, in India, China, these are young people who are discovering themselves, right? At the very key psychological stage of who am I? you know, and they want, they don't feel like they fit in. And then you put that within a space of patriarchal society. So for example, women who are extremely constrained in the way they can express themselves to also very conservative societies, which are all about how you should behave and the role of, you know, um, your social role, whether you're a boy in a particular caste family or a religious group. or So you have all these social cultural layers, which basically are, can be suffocating for the teenagers. So the digital is extremely liberating in relation to their everyday lives, right? And oftentimes, if you're a young person, you are occupied by underemployment. So you're working as a driver and then you're sitting in traffic in Philippines for, you know, hours at a time. So your mobile phone is your escape pod. So you can, you know, reinvent yourself and you can feel human, right? In this extraordinarily dehumanizing digital economy and physical economy. So the internet is often the leisure economy and often the only leisure economy because they're working all the time or the opposite, where they're deeply under or uh, unemployed, like in the case of Namibia, where majority of, like we're talking about, where I was in Namibia with my team, about half or majority of them were unemployed for years. So they went into deep depression and the internet was their main coping mechanism, right? So this goes against the whole pessimism bias right now, where we feel like the internet is 
killing our democracy, killing our social glue. And, you know, like the internet is in a, construed in a very negative light, but it is a privilege because majority of people actually are on a very opposite end of the spectrum. So these are just two cases, by the way, in terms of you must be wondering, what are these visuals? So, you know, the Justin Bieber is basically uh, a teenager uh, and t- this is very typical is the internet uh, economy is very much a romance economy. So they take hours to come up with these kinds of images. They Photoshop, they, you know, use Canva and all sorts of tools so they can serenade young women on Facebook, WhatsApp, and try to win their heart. And they want to also signal how globally engaged they are because they consider themselves global citizens. Or here you have Neil Renaud who is actually imitating or paying tribute to a famous Bollywood star. And he is a fashion influencer from a tier three town in India. And he has more followers than some of the top fashion brands in the world. And so these are just some you know, potentials of what's happening with the next billion user market, how they are self-actualizing and making themselves, you know, seen and heard, right? Um, myth two is privacy as a core value. I mean, living in Europe, you know, everybody's all particularly about privacy, privacy, privacy. And, you know, it's like that, yes, it has become one of the most paramount values, right? If we, if we did these sort of surveys and, uh, you know, compared surveys from like a decade ago, privacy was not a core value. In fact, it was, it wasn't a major concern, but today it's like a, one of the top concerns to a point that even Facebook has had to claim that it is a privacy co- based and privacy oriented company because it's all celebrating encryption. So it doesn't have to content moderate and doesn't have to regulate or be responsible. So it's not a coincidence, right? But privacy by far is one of the core values that Europeans are very preoccupied by. And this value is dictating assessment design. And yet when you turn your lens to the majority of the world, Privacy is a relative value because the the freedoms of visibility is much more important, which will make sense when you look at their socioeconomic environment. So this is a photo, these homes, a photo of a favela, which is a, a informal settlement, which is, by the way, where you know, um, billions of people are going to be residing, and this is going to be the normative. And that what this really is, is that there's not a full legal status to these housing developments. These are informal, often illegal settlements. And the average person lives in a family, like a one room home with three generations. So there's no privacy in terms of physical privacy, like your own room. And when you step out of your home, you are surrounded by neighbors and aunts and uncles who know you. So you're everyday public life is extremely lacking in privacy. So in relation to that, the, you know, even Facebook allows for more privacy because if you can learn the rules of the game, your WhatsApp, et cetera, right? So this is something, and even more so that because they're teenagers and deeply desperate to self-actualize, they're willing to take extraordinary risks despite you know, corporate surveillance, because the way they look at it is that if they, that, you know, uh, if their data is their currency, then that's okay, because it allows them possibilities and freedoms to express themselves, right? So it's a different kind of logic. And if you and I were in that position, we would probably make these choices, because we would feel privacy is an overvalued concept. Now, there's an even more disturbing trend, which is among women and girls. So, I was um, engaging with one of the, you know, usual tech uh, massive companies who have data on digital, you know, usage. And they approached me because they were extremely concerned that girls were dropping out of using not just, you know, Facebook, WhatsApp or any of these other usual suspects, but just the Internet. They looked at the entire Internet as not for them. That's hugely problematic. In fact, Women in the Web, Caribou International Report, even stated that in, from 2018, there's been a decline in mobile uptake amongst girls. Partly it's to do with, you know, disposable income. Partly it's to do with the fact that they have 
because of that and the gender gap in pay, they have less money and access to resources to buy a mobile phone or have access to one. But the most important reasons are social, cultural in nature, where it is disreputable to be online. It is considered unwomanly. Your dignity is at stake. Your reputation is at stake. In fact, you can have a, it could even lead to extraordinary bodily harm, as you've seen, whether it's in the cases of Iran to actually there is numerous cases, right, of girls you know, being punished for what would seem like innocuous behavior, like, you know, showing themselves, showing their face itself in many countries are considered immoral or indecent, right? And even pornographic by nature. So gender-based, you know, assessment needs to be very much looked at carefully and it deserves its own space because we're talking about half the world's population, right? And the last myth is about trickle-down tech and catch-up philosophy, this notion that, of course, Silicon Valley, just like the AI for good, will innovate in the West and disseminate to the rest. And actually, this is against the typical innovations if you look at what's happened even in the past. I mean, um, just India alone, right? If you want to see some of the cheapest cataracts being you know, done, it is in India. In fact, uh, you know, Arvind Eye Clinic has won numerous awards for the providing the cheapest uh, cataract operations and inclusive, you know, at inclusive pricing, 50% of them even get it for free. So um, this is because it is not taken, uh, the model is not designed with a capitalistic perspective, but more from a social benefit perspective, right, driven by the state in partnership with, you know, innovators. And then you can look at the prosthetic foot, Jaipur prosthetic foot, which is the cheapest in the world for like about $15, $20 versus, you know, uh, ten to 20000 in the U.S., for example. So, you know, I mean, I can list numerous examples. And if you want to look at where the future of fintech is, or well, not in the future, is already here, at least in China, which has pioneered innovative ways in which people can uh, you know, uh, move ahead with their financial, uh, you know, uh, documents and fa financial transactions uh, to India with this innovative tech stack, which allows for free and open access, you know, um, building of tools and services for the most essentials, which is registration with the identity, identification, financial transactions. And so these are very important sort of countermeasures to the corporatization of what we, we should be looking at as essential public digital infrastructures, right? So, all right. So I, I just want to share with you, like, so, you know, I, I'm trying to do my bit. This is just before the pandemic. We received, uh, you know, this is my uh, co-founder, Usha Raman. So we founded FemLab and Usha Raman is in University of Hyderabad in India. And we received uh, a lot of seed money from IDR, CEO and HCR and a number of so tech companies I can't list here uh, who genuinely want to see what's the future of inclusive design. In this case, we started off with the uh, digital economy. So we st this is just um, actually our uh, core team and there's many others, but um, this is our initiative where we put women's voices at the center, particularly low-income women uh, workers. And, you know, through their, uh, through their insights, their everyday usage, their concerns, their aspirations, we basically are trying to build stakeholder insight through ethnographic engagement. So as we, we put them at the center and then we see the different kind of institutions and agencies that intersect with enabling them. And we are, you know, basically operating in three, six different sectors from construction, artisanal, salon services, ride hailing, et cetera, right? Garment industry. And we've also partnered with Justice Ada, which is basically a design and legal uh, nonprofit from uh, University of Cambridge. And, uh, you know, and they are basically looking at, they take the legal jargon and make it an engaging multimedia storytelling, particularly to not just disseminate as, you know, a build awareness amongst consumers, but also directly to the recipients, right? And the third part of FemLab is we're basically 
uh, looking to basically design and uh, ethical design and deployment for empowering workers from below. So we, you know, basically um, give advice and um, we basically mentor a variety of different uh, aid agencies and uh, other inter uh, intermediaries. So I just will extract three small examples and conclude, which is uh, here's an insight from our ride hailing sector where it's counterintuitive. And the reason I'm bringing these examples up is that we should always sort of question, you know, what we see as defaults, right? Like, of course, automation is, you know, there's like automation, automating inequality or algorithms of expression. You have all these books out there. And here is a case where automation can be empowering, actually, because so here's a case in point. What's happening with the ride hailing uh, you know, apps in India, for example, is that what is very uh, difficult is that women need to be mobile, right? For And women are dropping out of their workplace. In fact, in the last few years, women in the workplace have actually declined in India, as well as the digital uh, in, uh, uptake. So it's a compounding alienation faced by women, right? And so this is extraordinarily, uh, you know, problematic. And what do you have as feminist ride-hailing app companies that have come up, you know, She Taxi and a variety of others. And it is extremely commendable, but the problem is that they do it manually in sort of linking companies and, you know, um, uh, consumers with the riders, right? I mean, with the drivers. And the problem is when you do this sort of mediating of social sorting, much of our social biases come in from the consumer perspective. So this is a female fleet owner who's complaining about this manual sorting and why she, by the way, left to work for Ola, and um, you know, which is the um, non-profit and the, the for-profit ride-hailing app, right, which is a counter from She Taxi. She said, this is what a typical, you know, uh, tech company client wants. They say, I don't want a girl with a Muslim name. What is her surname? What is the cast? She's too short. She's too tall. She's too thin. She's too dark. She doesn't look cool. All of that. These are the things that are happening when non -com uh, not commercial cast, but private placement bookings take place. So people across board are actually demanding as a right aesthetic and right kind of person. And so there is power and anonymity, right? So um, another case is we are working in the construction sector. And for those who may be aware, during the peak of the pandemic pre-vaccination, we had one of the biggest internal migrant exodus back from, from cities into the villages. It was equivalent to that of the partition between India and Pakistan in terms of the astounding scale. And it was a shock to the fabric of the Indian social life because it made visible the tremendous dependencies and vulnerabilities of millions of people, right? Now, what happened is that they immediately, you know, there's a lot of pressure and Indian government got the act together and they started to promise for bailouts to a lot of these people who lost their jobs. But the pro problem is in the uh, construction industry, 94% of them did not claim these bailout money. So we were looking into it. Our FEM lab was looking into why. And part of the reason was that, you know, there's disincentivization to register because it's decentralized. And much of the workers are migrants by default because they seek for work opportunities. And often internal migrants, they move from villages, but they have their home in the village. Right. And they come there. So it's not a permanent move. They are moving between because they go back. It's seasonal work. So that is why they fall between the cracks. And it is not designed for migrancy. It's not designed for these social phenomena. Right. And they, in fact, it's also created even more inefficiencies with digital intermediaries because added layers of corruption who would mediate their registration into the system. Right. And the last example is where we are, FemLab is also looking at, you know, urban company and other sort of um, companies that deliver home-based services, right? Like uh, salon-based services. And what's very interesting here is that th this is an interesting example because they've been criticized heavily in the media for those who've been, you know, about reforming 
how the algorithm is shaped. And now they are pushing for positive nudges where they tell you, well, have you offered a glass of water to your uh, service provider? Have you, uh, you know, have you allowed them to sit? Have you, so they are allowing for uh, positive nudges and also allowing the uh, people who are the providers, these service providers to actually rate their own customers for bias, et cetera. So if there's a critical amount, then they will not be served. So this is about inserting ethical friction into design. So just to wrap up, right, is, you know, we need to stop bracketing Global South as if it's some sort of exotic margins. It is the radical normative. If we can think by default in a global terms. In fact, if you can think about the more vulnerable populations, but aspirational popul uh, po populations, which is really equally important because they're not sort of beneficiaries sitting idle waiting to be rescued. They're extremely ingenious in the way they're maximizing and optimizing digital tools to meet the needs despite these tremendous barriers from you know, across institutions. So if we can design for them, we are by default designing for all in a sort of a genuinely inclusive manner. We need to not just, you know, this typical adage, think global, act local. We need to stop. We need to also act global in a responsible way, because if we need to be honest about the full spectrum of the global supply chain, the global value chain, because we seem to value only that which is within the fortress Europe and we pretend that the rest of it doesn't matter. And so I see this happening from grants. I see this happening in my own university where there's millions that are going into AI-based design, but it's all even at a granular level, at the city-based or, you know, at a country-based. But, you know, the term global is barely to be seen, actually. Um, and pessimism bias is a privilege because we can, you know, we can talk about how terrible the internet and digital media is, but the fact remains it is a way out for millions of people who are fast coming online and is the future of the internet, right? And so we do need to also understand that there is a case to be made for reflexive universality because inclusivity, you know, has this notion of, it can actually lead to higher fragmentation. And there is a, a virtue in rethinking what, you, you know, uh, what values we should hold dear and will be resilient regardless of cultural dynamics, social dynamics. What can we fight for, whether it's gender equity, right, in terms of the right for women to be visible, to be protected, to have a safe space online, right? to be able to optimize their visibility without like a cyber harassment. So these are, these are, you know, worth looking at regardless of saying, oh, but it is a cultural thing, you know, and it's not, we have to like fight for these sort of universals. And, you know, I'm glad to see that, you know, digital anthropology is being respected to some degree or gaining respect to some degree as my engagements with a lot of these tech companies and elsewhere uh, a testament to, but it is not without an uphill battle because it's still time and again, I've been asked, isn't that just anecdotal? But then, you know, sometimes I'm facetious with them and I say, well, you know, some of the best changes happen because of an anecdote, right? People don't change because of dry statistics. They change because of the story that you tell. And that's what anthropology is that it's very inherent. You know, the heart of it is we have a you know compelling story to be told, which will hopefully inspire for change at an inclusive level. And you know, one of the things we've faced, like with FemLab, is with all these different sectors, is that we have come to recognize that we need to think in by default that it is you know our design systems, our assessments should be cross sectoral. What I mean by that is that if there's a problem about, you know, how people are registered and their digital identities in the construction sector, that's very transferable to other sectors because these are vulnerabilities being faced by many different populations in different sectors. It's, you know, you have Tesla challenging the German auto industry. So here you have a database company challenging an auto industry, which a decade ago was an impossible, you know, perspective. So we have to think that these 
sectors are going to merge again and again. And whether it's banking is happening through TikTok or, you know, romance economies are taking place on Facebook or variety. I mean, these are all disruptive spaces. And last but not least is I have to make the case to embrace your imposter syndrome because many people, and I'm pretty sure in this room, have this nagging feeling that do I quite fit because you're never sure how much of an expert you are because these are very confounding times because we're told to do interdisciplinary work, but it always comes at the price of something which is deep expertise. So there's always a trade-off, particularly with the way things are changing from a global perspective. There are a lot of dynamics at play, right? Uh, intersectoral perspective. So we have to, you know, be mobile, agile, right? And be open to change and be humble with what we don't know. And that's why it's really intrinsically important to have a diversity in your assessment teams, in your production teams, in your, you know, in your services teams, because that way it's okay to be an imposter because everybody else is, as long as you have a common goal, which is to create inclusive design for all, I think we'll be good. And with that, let me stop sharing and thank you.